Hi, everybody. My name is Mary Gray, and I'm a permanent researcher at Microsoft Research over in Cambridge, uh, Kendall Square. So came up, hopped a couple of squares, and I'm also um, on the faculty at Indiana University in the Anthropology, Gender Studies, American Studies, and Media School. So uh, those are all separate departments and then a school. I like to collect those affiliations, you know, like box tops. Um, so I have the great pleasure today to introduce to you uh, the PhD interns who are working with Microsoft Research this summer in the New England lab. And um, they're all pretty amazing, stellar, emerging scholars. And I want to save their time and not necessarily repeat uh, bio information they're going to share with you. But Ifeoma, Stacy, Nathan, Alina are here to talk with you about the work that they've done and how it connects to the work they're gonna do this summer. I wanted to just share with you some information very briefly about our internship program because I think these emerging scholars, their scholarship really represents um, something we, I would say, desperately need in academic and industry settings and that's um, folks who can do bridge work. People who can um, work between industry settings, university settings, and remind us all about how and why we need to connect with each other. Um, each of their projects are also um, taking a tack that is not common in media and technology studies. It's a more social critical approach, so you're going to hear um, mostly about qualitative, uh, qualitatively driven projects. So I think our group is particularly interested in showing the value of taking an approach that isn't um, the more familiar uh, methodologies that we see in industry and in university settings that look at technology and media. It's a 12-week program, and um, though it's sometimes called a summer institute or summer internship program, we do have folks who will, who will apply for this. So I'm, I'm saying this generically as though there might be potential applicants in the room or people who could share this information with their peers but we are always looking for people who are interested in taking this more critical qualitative approach. Um, and we uh, will um, usually post uh, our announcements in October on our blog about the internship program. We have labs all over the world and each of those labs accepts up to um, around 100 PhD students to do this work. Um, and it can really range in terms of what kind of proposals people want to pitch. And probably most importantly, and, and maybe sadly, Microsoft Research is pretty unique in that whatever a PhD student does, it's available for public consumption. It's not head, you know, hid behind a walled garden. The expectation is that you're sharing it with your peers and building on a scholarly conversation. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty unique opportunity to be able to do some, um, do some work that both feeds uh, academic conversations, but also might give um, scholars a chance to connect with uh, product groups or other groups that could really benefit from their expertise and their insight. So let me stop the promo of the Microsoft Research Internship Program that I hope many people in this room will apply for. Um, and remind you that for these lunches, we will be doing a webcast uh, of the presentations that will be available on the Berkman website. Um, within a few days, it's pretty miraculous, it's like magic. And uh, part of today's uh, conversation is um, you. So we'll at one point after the presentations be able to turn to questions, discussion. I'll be moderating um, that time and I'll be looking for uh, bringing as many t of us to the table as possible. So I'll just be um, picking folks and trying to draw out voices that may may not always be heard at the table, so just be aware, I'll, if you have your hand up and you've spoken a couple times, I might ask you to step back and let others speak. Um, uh, we'll also be recording your responses, so please make sure to ask your question into the mic so that we can get your question um, on the webcast so that people can hear it. There's a back channel as well, is that true? Is there a back channel for Berkman this, uh, for this discussion? Hashtag Berkman. Ooh, hashtag Berkman for those folks who like to hashtag things. Um, so please feel free to share out what's said here because it is um, going beyond this room. So just keep that in mind when you're asking questions or making a statement. So with that, let me pass it over to our first speaker, Ifeoma. Good afternoon. Um, so hello, uh, Burke Maniacs, Burke Interns, and the Cambridge and Boston community. Um, Many thanks to the Bergman Center for agreeing to host this talk. 
Um, to introduce myself, I'm a PhD candidate in the Sociology Department of Columbia University. And writ large, um, my research is preoccupied with data, <clears throat> notably the privacy ramifications of our voracious appetite for data, the legal issues presented by the inelegant analysis and interpretation of data, uh, and uh, the ways that data could be employed to widen the divide of inequality. And as an FYI, um, for all the computer scientists, I tend to think of data as a collective singular noun. So bear with me. <laughs> so almost everything we do uh, generates data. <clears throat> this was uh, a quote by Gary Wolf, who is a proponent of the quantified self movement. Uh, however, in the book, uh, Data and Goliath, Gary Schneier writes about the government and corporate surveillance that Americans are subjected to in their daily lives. And similarly, in the Black Box Society, Professor pra Frank Pasquale writes about data miners and data brokers who trawl the internet for our data and how so much of big data is fed through algorithms, secret algorithms, right, that determine how financial institutions and other corporations choose to interact with us. Um, but what about the data we generate from logging our own lives? The quantified self-movement is the belief that self-tracking or self-logging, as it is termed, can lead to greater self-knowledge and can provide solutions for health and work productivity. But should we be concerned that this small data could be co-opted in ways that are ultimately detrimental to our agency and personhood? How can we allow for the autonomy and personal expression that is life logging while protecting against the loss of privacy and the new opportunities for discrimination? For the computer scientists in the room again, I would say that this problem is hard, maybe not NP hard, Let's call it quantified self heart. Um, so today I want to talk about the ways that um, our data may be used against us, right? As Kate Crawford uh, recently wrote about in The Atlantic, small data from a fitness tracker has been introduced into the courtroom in Canada. This time the data was introduced by the plaintiff's attorney as part of a personal injury case. But imagine that next time it could be your insurance company asking for your fitness tracker data before they will uh, uh, agree to insure you or determine um, how much to charge your, you for premiums. It could also be your employer asking for the same data to determine whether they should continue to retain you as an employee. Um, so. I, f I see the quantified self movement as a manifestation, right, of a societal desire for certainty and accurate prediction of risk. But we should not be so seduced by the shiny apple of knowledge that we neglect to inquire as to the costs. I ask you to consider that the quantified self may have a dual meaning. Yes, it can refer to the self-knowledge that derives from tracking our most intimate and minute biofunctions and processes. But it can also refer to the uh, quantification and subsequent discounting of certain classes of people based on perceived risks. In my research, I have seen the desire for the quantification of risk result in the widening of inequality and in startling encroachments in privacy. So take, for example, uh, the plight of the formerly incarcerated. The discounting of formerly incarcerated individuals through permanent criminal records has resulted in a paucity of second chances for those individuals in the workplace. Uh, formerly incarcerated people find themselves permanently branded with a modern day scarlet letter in the form of collateral legal consequences that disqualify them from certain professions and that serve to exclude them from needed governmental benefits. This quantification of people also plays out in the genetics arena. <clears throat> As the technology of genetic testing progresses, Americans now experience genetic coercion 
which is an overwhelming compulsion to scrutinize and police the genome. Consider that since 2008, all newborns in America have been required to undergo genetic testing for disease. And that 85% of American consumers uh, express a desire to engage in genetic testing. Uh, the quantification of individuals also plays out in the workplace. In my current research work at uh, Microsoft Research with Kate Crawford, we focus on the quantification of workers. Uh, Louis Brandeis is credited with popularizing the term scientific management. Uh, this term was then adopted by Frederick Taylor for his theory of management, uh, also known as Taylorism. But unlike Taylorism, where the focus was on the job task itself and breaking it down into minute uh, compartments that could then be mastered, the focus now is on the individual worker's body and in the organization or corporation mastering the individual worker's body for greater productivity, or better yet, inducing the individual worker to master their own body for the benefit of the corporation. Yet, in what Professor Julie Cohen has identified as a surveillance innovation complex, uh, organizations seek to remove this process from the regulation reach of the state by presenting the increased surveillance of individual workers' bodies as enabling innovation and economic growth. Our research at MSR focuses specifically on workplace wellness programs, which uh, is a $6 billion annual industry uh, dedicated to promoting healthy behavior among workers. These programs encourage healthful diet and exercise, uh, and they track uh, people's weight, people's smoking, and people's uh, spending habits. Our research then seeks to understand uh, the standards applied to the data collected from these programs and how this data and the interpretation of this data could impact the worker from whom it is generated. As computer scientists, as social scientists, as lawyers, we must keep asking, how can we make technology work for us rather than against us? How can we harness the compu computing power of both big and small data while being vis vigilant that such power does not create divides uh, and inequality or open new avenues for discrimination? Thank you very much for your kind attention. I look forward to your questions. Hello, everybody. All right, well, I, uh, talking with Nathan, um, took up what he called an opportunity to introduce myself to the Berkman community of interns and scholars that are here. Um, I'm excited to be here in Boston. I'm a PhD candidate from the University of Illinois at Chicago, and I'm in the communication department, but I have this really unique opportunity there where I'm in a fellowship program where we bring together computer scientists, computer engineers, the health school, and communication scholars to study issues of privacy. So the opportunity to come to MSR, which also has a very similar uh, environment of people coming together from different fields to look at different issues in, in computing and social, particularly the social media collective, was a great opportunity for me um, to tie together some of my previous research. Um, so I take privacy research, and from that perspective, I'm usually looking at how do people enact privacy? So when you go on Facebook and you think, oh, I'm gonna post this scene of me celebrating the Blackhawks victory last night at the bar, and I go, well, do I want my mom to see this? Do I want my dad to see this? Do I want my boss to see this? Um, and so we look at the behaviors that people do online and then the, the considerations that go into those behaviors. But what I found doing that research was that we're kind of ignoring the platform that these behaviors take place on, and we're treating them as very neutral. So that's kind of led me down this path where I started looking at as you mentioned, the data that is collected and the algorithms uh, that then in turn use that data to provide information to us and personalize what we see on the web. And I've taken the opportunity here at Microsoft to 
work with some people who specialize in very qualitative discourse analysis, which is something that I'm here to learn more about how to do and do well. Uh, so this is a, an opportunity for me to move away from some of the more quantified stuff that I do um, and move into this uh, discourse analysis arena. So the project that I'm gonna do while I'm here involves uh, looking at the Facebook newsfeed algorithm. Facebook uh, put together a page that they call Facebook Tips, and this is a public page that um, hosts, you can go there and they'll, they'll provide you information on how to uh, look at who's around you with your friends and use icons, and they also post a lot of information about how the newsfeed works. So I'm going to be taking a look at this page, um, and particularly several videos that they posted. Um, these are actually all the videos that they posted, and all these are tagged under the headline, uh, Newsfeed Created by You. Um, so there are several different examples. Um, we have men and women, different ages. But what's interesting about these is Facebook pushed them out through the sponsored posts. So they did generate a lot of views. Um, in the, the larger world of Facebook, it might not be a lot, but in terms of millions of video views, it got a lot of traction. Um, so I've collected those videos, and in additionally, um, I've collected all the comments that were posted on those videos, and I'll talk a little bit about that more, but I want to give you an example of one of the videos, so we'll see if this works. Through my news feed, I actually found an amazing gym, and I made a commitment to change my life for good. I was able to, like, surround myself with so many inspiring, ridiculous, crazy people with, with so much knowledge and expertise, and I was like... I just want to know what you know. So I made my news feed about wellness, nutrition, and just how to live your best life. A community that I can look forward to seeing every day. So Tim is completely and solely responsible, apparently, for creating the news feed that, that he gets to see. Um, and what I'm hitting at is something that several of the researchers at Microsoft focus on, and it's that discourse matters. Um, it's very important the way that companies present themselves to users. It's very important the way that users then understand how these things work in their lives and make sense of them. So the focus of my research is to look at the discourse um, going on between Facebook and the users, both in the videos and how they present these algorithms to be working. And then also, interestingly, Facebook, as you can see on the, I guess it would be your right um, side, Facebook responded to most of the comments that were posted in the first week of uh, each video going up. And these videos were posted in early, or sorry, in late 2014. So I was hoping I would be able to read the screen from here, but here's an example of a video, or a comment, sorry. The, the user says, this leads me to believe I have control over my own feed. I don't. Facebook is constantly making things disappear and rearranging the timeline. I don't want to see something from six days ago when I can't see one thing I did want to see from an hour ago. And Facebook replies, hi, Daryl. In order to see stories in your news feed in the order they were posted, please follow these steps in our help center. We hope this helps. That one's kind of sterile. Um, that response is very corporate-y feeling to me. Uh, but the responses change depending on the types of uh, questions that are asked. Um, so another one is, why do I keep getting old posts? And Facebook replies, sometimes the story that you've already seen will reappear toward the top of your newsfeed because many of your friends have liked or commented on it. This helps you see popular stories that your friends are interacting with most and joining conversations around posts. Um, what's interesting is Facebook, um, and I'm just starting this, so I've collected the data, and I'm at the very beginning of this project. Um, but looking at some of the posts that we've seen, Facebook uses very awkward languages to avoid saying that we do this. It's always you do this, or your friends do that. And so it's going to be, I think it's going to be a very interesting project, but as I mentioned, I'm at the very, very, very beginning of it. So the analysis that I'll be looking at um, through these comments is the user to Facebook. Um, and I'm looking at you know, questions as, how do the users discuss the news feed? Um, I think there will be an opportunity. Um, a lot of the algorithm research keeps asking for more understandings of how people understand algorithms in society and, and what they know about them. And I think that this is a unique space to actually look at and see people openly discussing this news feed algorithm. Um, which technically is algorithms. Um, so what is their understanding? Um, I'm also looking at Facebook's positioning to the user in those responses that they give back. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, where do they place the responsibility? Um, and then lastly, user to user. So towards the end, when Facebook stops answering, um, after about a week of the videos being posted, they answered most of the, the comments, and then they stop. And you see a lot of the users trying then to step in and explain how the algorithm is working to each other without Facebook's uh, mediation. So that's uh, the gist of my project, and I look forward to hearing your feedback on it because I'm just starting. So thank you very much.
Hi, I'm Nathan. I'm a PhD student at the MIT Media Lab and Center for Civic Media, as well as a Berkman Fellow. And the question I've been asking, or at least I'm retroactively uh, forcing onto my prior work, is this question of how can we hold crowds accountable to the public? And I'm going to be sharing three examples. And I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on this idea and how we might take it further. The first one is peer production. How might we hold Wikipedia accountable as the public for the power that it plays in society as often the first port of call for information? And one way to do it is to create a petition addressed to Jimmy Wales, which is exactly what this group of homeopathy advocates did after many years of trying to convince Wikipedia's editors to be more permissive of homeopathy related information. So they said, Jimmy Wales, we really need you to take an executive action on Wikipedians, and they promise not to donate to Wikipedia. This is a, a model that we're used to seeing with corporations. You create a pressure campaign, you petition uh, a powerful entity, and you try to embarrass the company into protecting its brand. But does that really work with Wikipedia, which is a global movement of people who are uh, contributing, often pseudonymously? Another example was this case in 2014, or 2013, where a novelist noticed that articles about women novelists were being pushed out of the novelist category and into the women novelist category on Wikipedia. And she wrote a New York Times op-ed, she wrote her colleagues, and at the end of the article she says, well, we talked about it a lot and we've noticed that some Wikipedians are changing the articles. Um, again, it's this idea that if you raise attention about something that there's maybe, uh, maybe Wikipedians aren't quite structured like a corporation, but if you talk about it, something might change. And this is an area that I've worked on with design interventions, uh, with projects to broaden the diversity of uh, Wikipedia's content about women. You'll notice that uh, there's about the same ratio of biographies about women in Wikipedia as there are uh, obituaries about women in the New York Times. And often when people create infographics about issues like this, they'll do it as a way to kind of prompt outrage to channel attention towards these powerful individuals. With the Passing On Project, we thought Wikipedia actually is something that if you disagree with it, you can join it and you can participate to change it. So we created a crowdsourcing site where people could um, learn more about the amazing people who appeared in New York Times obituaries, find out if they appear in Wikipedia, and through the pr process of reading more about those people, uh, the system would reader source, automatically create bundles of content that could go into Wikipedia from that, uh, channeling that frustration into a way that is compatible with how Wikipedia works. It's a project I'm continuing to explore with the Wikimedia Foundation. Another question has to do with how we hold social networks accountable for their influence in society. And when I say that, I don't just mean companies. Here's a slide from a recent Facebook study that tried to quantify uh, different sources of uh, bias in the news that people access. This is a chart of the uh, percentage of newsfeed articles appearing in this particular sample's newsfeeds that were from uh, bipartisan or neutral, politically neutral sources. And they identified a number of causes or reasons why someone might have a biased newsfeed. One might be the media. The media is just publishing a certain ratio across available publications of content. Another might be your friends. You choose who you are friends with and they share information and you see the information shared by your friends. Another might be the newsfeed algorithm, which we've heard a little bit about. And Facebook was keen to, to note that it probably had the least impact on what people were reading of all of them. And then, of course, your personal decisions. And in my re research, I'm less interested in the question of the newsfeed, and I'm much more interested in all of those other social factors. And what it means to hold uh, our networks accountable, uh, which are, is much trickier to figure out than uh, what it means to hold, say, Facebook accountable for the algorithms that it has. 
And one example of a design intervention is the project I created in partnership with Sarah Salovitz, which is follow bias that we're currently doing tests on with journalists, which, which shows people the gender ratio of who they pay attention to on Twitter. We can think of journalists as a crowd that do actually have a big influence on society, and it is a matter of public interest who they choose to pay attention to and who they use as sources. And we're trying to see if providing them with a the chance to uh, be more aware of the gender ratio of who they follow and make suggestions to each other actually has an impact on how they uh, carry out their work. And we might also think about distributed decision making. Uh, coming back to Wikipedia, there was a controversy earlier this year where um, Wikipedia allegedly uh, was uh, taking moderation actions, ban topic banning some editors from very controversial Gamergate-related topics. And um, actually, local scholar Mark Bernstein noticed this and wrote a blog post about it in like a classic like uh, accountability journalism style, saying this is a problem, we need to do something about it, Wikipedia isn't doing enough about it. And uh, journalists started writing about this issue, uh, very much following that accountability journalism frame. So they, they made various claims that they then had to retract because the journalists writing about Wikipedia didn't actually understand the various groups and processes and structure of how Wikipedia worked and had to rewrite substantial parts of that article. Um, and it raises this question. It turns out that there's this entity in the English language Wikipedia called ARBCOM who handles various controversies and arbitration issues. They only have a limited scope. And, and suddenly, people found themselves mired in the po internal politics of Wikipedia and unsure how even to talk to Wikipedia or Wikipedians or the Wikimedia Foundation or Jimmy Wales to get this issue addressed. Although since that, we've started to see articles in the press that are going beyond saying Wikipedia has a problem to talking about the specific politics of Wikipedia, as in this Newsweek article that was actually reporting on the Wikipedia Arbitration Committee, uh, describing it as uh, the highest court in Wikipedia land, and starting to think about reporting on it in similar ways as they might report on other forms of governance in society. And so for my work uh, here at Microsoft and ongoing research, I'm starting to think more about uh, the people that play these profoundly important roles in our online lives, who make decisions about what to uh, delete, who to suspend, um, what the norms are in our communities. One example of that is a report I did with many of the people at Berkman uh, doing an audit of how Twitter handles uh, harassment and looking at the process of reporting, reviewing, and responding to harassment on, on Twitter. Uh, it came about because the advocacy organization Women Action in the Media took three weeks to receive harassment reports from members of the public and then forwarded them on to Twitter. And we were able to then look at the data that they collected in that process, data that's usually hidden inside of companies, to get greater visibility on uh, this kind of uh, process. So we looked at who was reporting harassment, the kinds of harassment that were being reported, as well as the experience of handling this work, which is often very taxing. It's very time intensive. Uh, in WAM's case, it was volunteer driven. On sites like Wikipedia and Reddit, it's also done unpaid by volunteers and can have very serious mental health risks. So this summer, I'm asking two questions. Firstly, I'm looking at the work of Reddit moderators. There are over 550,000 subreddits across Reddit and uh, over 100,000 moderators who have this official role on Reddit. And I'll be doing qualitative work to understand how they see their work, what they see as their job and not their job, and how they're responding to more recent controversies around Reddit's um, corporate role in uh, moderating uh, behavior and speech on the site. And I'll also be continuing to ask further about this Gamergate controversy as I ask the question, what does it mean to hold crowds accountable for the power they have in our public lives? Thanks.
Okay, hi everyone, my name is Alina and I'm from Indiana University, but before introducing you guys to me, I want to introduce you to the work that I do in a uh, virtual game. It's an MMO, a massively multiplayer online game called EVE Online, and this is what it's like to be an EVE Online player. And come on. How do I work to something? E-war drone. All E-war drones on Scott. Why are you decloaking? Ah, someone be the second there. Oh my green friends, it's hard to... Let's go get those f***ing bombs out. Rank your fire. Gold group, stand by. Come on, boys. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Yeah! All right, so that was just a tiny snippet for you right there of, uh, of this ma massively multiplayer online game. And uh, I'm from Indiana University. I'm finishing up my PhD there, and I'm also interning this summer at uh, Microsoft Research. So a little bit about my dissertation. Um, I've, tra I've been training as a media anthropologist, and um, my focus is on consumer culture. So I study gaming communities. So these are people who play games together. They hang out online. Um, they talk to each other in person, uh, as well as online about their hobbies. And what interests me about these gaming communities is how they make sense of, first of all, their personal place and role in this massive world. EVE Online is a huge world. What you saw in that clip was actual player dialogue. So this is the, them talking on the comms. It's been edited by the company, but it's all actual people. Um, and how do they carve out their own little corner of space? My research shows that it's made sensible through spectacular branded rituals where these lights, these sounds, these human bodies, and um, alcohol as well come together in just the right alignment for players to see, to hear, to touch, as well as to feel that they are truly part of something larger than themselves. So this happens at Brand Fest, but it also happens uh, within the game itself. How do players make sense of the hours and efforts spent on this game and its community? Right? Gamers, especially in this game, are really hardcore. They spend hours and hours every week building up their own little empire within the game. And it's made sensible through reward and reputation systems within the game itself, but also within the wider gaming community. Some of these reputation and reward systems are designed by companies, but others emerge from the community itself. Finally, I ask, how do players make sense of this time that they've invested in the hobby of their identities as gamers and as EVE Online gamers? Well, it's made sensible through discussions about work-life balance, and through these expectations that gamers have, but not only them, but all kinds of hobbyists, all kinds of consumers who see their work of consumption as somehow productive, how do they create value? And by this, I mean economic value, but not just that, cultural value, social value from one's hobbies. And at the base of all these rituals, these systems, these expectations, are what I call compensatory drives, where players use to get things to add up, get things to even out, and also to get what's coming to them. When you think about compensation, you may think about recompense, or retribution, or requital. And it's not the same thing as, but it's also con connected to other ideas about counterbalancing of effects, as well as the neutralizing of forces. At the end of the day, in the games that we play, we seek balance. At the end of the day, in our voluntary social activities, what we seek is a kind of moral equilibrium. And these compensatory forces, they are at work to connect players to this massive and yet somehow intangible world and to give gaming communities a sense of fairness and justice and finally to give gaming practices a sense or a kind of aesthetic, economic and social legitimacy. So my internship project for this summer uh, is about EVE Online. And as you can see, it's a space game. You fly around in space, but you also work a lot with all these little, you know, pop-up windows, you know, almost like spreadsheets. 
right? Uh, and it's a hyper-capitalist world where the universe is really overrun by corporations. There are no governments, warfare, murder, theft, all these are sanctioned as long as you can get away with it. And within this really exciting world, <laughs> there is a group of players who are consultants to the game company, yet they have been democratically elected by these players. These players have cast their votes um, to have these consultants represent their interests within the game to developers. And it's very interesting to me how this savage fictional world is somehow managed through surprisingly civilized processes. So on one hand, we have player representation. And then on the other hand, we have corporate consulta consultation, excuse me. And it seems, you know, okay, of course, you know, it makes total sense, but players have demands that are very, in a way, micro level. They want this mechanism to be twerked in this way because it benefits their player group. Developers, on the other hand, have very macro level concerns. They are concerned with the overall system and how it works for all the players. And of course, profits. On the other hand, there are informal systems of accountability. If these representatives or these consultants don't do their job, they don't get elected. They also get complained at all the time via email, on the forums, uh, and at conventions. However, when they do this consultancy work, they have no real power to make decisions within the company. All they can do is recommend, and the developers are obligated to listen. So what I'm doing this summer is that I'm going to be looking at meeting minutes over these five years uh, that this council has existed between the developers and these player consultants. I'm also going to be looking at town hall me uh, minutes or meetings, excuse me, between the council members and the player base. Finally, I'm also going to be looking at election campaign materials uh, and responses to them. And what I'm interested in is how do these actors Council members, players, developers, how do they articulate their roles and how do they articulate their roles in relation to each other, right? Where does my job as a player end and where does your job as a consultant start? I'm also tracing how players learn to become council members over their term of office, right? Consultancy or the identity of a consultant doesn't just happen. And through these meeting minutes, you can actually trace how they become in a way socialized or trained into the language of game development, how they become trained in the language of thinking broadly for the company instead of thinking uh, about player demands. And finally, I'm trying to map these feedback channels, not just the official feedback channels that all these online game communities have, such as forums, um, uh, uh, comms, emails, but also the informal feedback mechanisms, and most importantly, their directionality. Remember that feedback doesn't just run up the chain from players to consultants to developers, it also runs down. The consultants have this job, uh, whether it's implicit or explicit, to in a way advocate for the company to spread corporate goodwill to the masses. All right. So finally, a couple of points for discussion today. Right. If we can think about these voting mechanisms within this player consultancy group as one kind of democratic mechanism across proprietary media platforms and consumer practices. Right. It's not just this player council, but thinking back even to reality TV shows where there was audience voting, right? Thinking forward to different kinds on a smaller scale of um, uh, player tribunals or player guilds that have some kind of vote voting mechanism involved. We can think about these in a couple of ways. We can think about them as market populism. You know, the same old story. This is neoliberalism at work, right? Consumption rituals are, have been replacing for several decades real, authentic, democratic engagement. On the other hand, we can think about it as consumer co-creation. This is a different version of customer relations. Um, deliberation in this case is commoditized into a kind of very pleasurable and also very valuable branded experience. Right? Giving feedback is not just to make the system better, it in fact makes your own experience as a consumer more exciting more engaging. Finally, I think it's really interesting to think about the design of user experiences. Those of you who are designers here, you know that when you think about engagement, you don't want to give the user what they want. They have no idea what they want. That again is a kind of narrative that developers use to, uh, to in a way, filter or discount popular will. 
finally, the overall question that I'm asking is, how are these kinds of democratic mechanisms, how are they changing the means and meanings of consumption? Right? And I'd like to hear from you guys in the next couple minutes. So could I ask our, um, our speakers to come up here? I think that might be easier if you're all visible in front. Maybe bring your chairs around if that's okay. And, um, and I will hold all of my questions and comments because I get the pleasure of working with these people all summer long. So uh, with that, let me open it up to, to the group. Questions or comments? Yes. Uh, Nathan, this is for you. Uh, I'm curious how, how, how you can, de how crowds develop, and, or how crowds are different from simply users or consumers or patients. Um, you've selected Wikipedia where it's kind of obvious there's a crowd, but I don't know what the, how to define that kind of crowd and distinguish it from other groups. Thanks, Ethan. That, that seems like an especially important question that I imagine you've thought a lot about in your like dispute resolution work as well as, as you know, there are different parties that we think about as needing accountability. We might think about individuals or institutions. Uh, I think I'm using crowd as a placeholder term for now to refer to a variety of things that we, we don't quite yet know where to apply the lever to change things. Um, and it might be like a cumulative uh, effect of like the social choices and the friendships that we have in a, in a, like a, like in a network. Um, but it might also be something more identifiable uh, as a group in the case of something like uh, Wikipedia's arbitration committee. Um, I'd love to continue to like figure out together what those different structures and forms are, because I think that's important to understanding them as well as coming up with strategies for holding uh, those different structures and, and uh, groups accountable. Oh, no, we for being able to catch the recording, sorry. And if I could ask folks to say their name and affiliation, please. Hi, I'm Rebecca Wexler. I'm a JD candidate at Yale and a visiting scholar here in history of science. And my question is for the last presentation, is voting, or what, uh, what is your model of the authentic democratic engagement that neoliberalism has replaced over the past series of decades? And I thought I heard from you that voting might be that model. Is that correct? And could you expand on it? Well, my, my version, or my utopia, if you will, would be a kind of participatory democracy, right? But I think not so much, my thinking is not so much towards official political systems. My thinking is more in terms of how can the media allow citizens to participate? And uh, there's a lovely book that I've been reading uh, by Nico Carpentier, right, which has a very nice framework for thinking about participation in the media specifically and how different levels of engagement and different mechanisms can be used, not just to engage um, users or to engage audiences, but to really give them decision-making power in the systems, but also in the content. And it's far off, but I think we work inch by inch, we'll get there someday. Hi, I'm, I'm Charlton Gillespie. I'm a principal researcher at Microsoft. And I get them all summer, but I'm going to ask a question anyway. Um, <laughs> so I was thinking, uh, especially uh, Nathan, Alina, and um, Stacy's projects, if you, know, you can weigh in too, that you're clearly looking at a place where uh, you're trying to think about how groups of people think about their role in a place and negotiate the relationship between some platform or operator that's got a role to play. But then I think in a number of them, there's an additional thing, which is that the world is meant to be something. And it's most obvious in EVE Online, where there's a kind of narrative. Wikipedia clearly has an idea of itself. And Facebook is proposing ideas of itself, maybe much, quiet, much more quietly in the videos. So I'm just curious to hear, because that's kind of a thread that goes through a lot of the projects, like, 
that part about not just what should the group do, classic sort of governance problems, and what's the relationship between that set of people and some institution, but the additional problem of like the narrative or claim or nature of the institution, is that narrative representation, is that masking the real problems of governance? Is it distorting? Is it facilitating? Is it shaping? Like what's the right verb for that sentence, the, those claims and that picture of what it's supposed to be and its involvement into this problem? I haven't spoken yet, so I guess I'll, I'll jump in. Um, you know, it's interesting because my project stacked against Nathan's project shows kind of two different layers of analysis of basically the same problem. Um, and I think more evident in your work is uh, the, the putting the responsibility, and we had a brief chat about this, so I'm informed, um, about how um, in the media there's this, um, well, one, the word algorithm, as though it's a single thing, and that we can just identify this one thing and maybe tweak it, and then everything will be fixed. And that does assume that there's, that we know how to fix what it is that we're trying to fix. And I think that that is not something that I claim to know, um, and I would not go there, uh, but I think that for my work, uh, transparency is a word that's used or as something that's lacking a lot in the um, in the news feeds that we get, in the Google search results that we get, in the algorithms that that uh, kind of mediates the information that we get. And so, what I'm kind of trying to look at is. Um, the way that Facebook presents it to those users to see what reality they are trying to shape for them. It's really interesting if you watch, um, Facebook recently had its annual conference where it spoke to marketers about the newsfeed, and the newsfeed is all we, 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 and this is what we do, as opposed to when you're like, talking to the users, and it's you, 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 and this is how you tweak it. So um, part of you know, my larger project is just looking at those different realities um, based on the audiences that they're, they're speaking to. Sure, uh, one of the like inspirations that I keep finding myself returning to in, in this work is Arlie Hochschild's work on um, airline attendance. And there was a case where like, there was a clear brand um, driving how these attendants would handle like tough situations. And Hochschild looked at the training process that these people went through uh, in order to not just learn um, what to do in tough situations, but like how to be um, and how to emote and how to feel in those contexts. And you know, in that kind of situation where there's a, like you're working for the company and you might lose your job, um, there's a lot, there's like a really strong tie, at least in the hopes of the company and the and expectations that those things will be very close. Um, as I look at things like the onboarding process for new moderators, there are job boards on Reddit where people apply and post opportunities. I'm really curious because Reddit has some basic uh, rules, but each subreddit also has a process where it defines what kind of norms and rules are important to it. So I think I'll be paying like special attention to how moderators see themselves in relation to the kind of expectations and their vision of their subreddit, um, as well as their like expectation of vision of what like a Reddit community would be like. Well, to the question of what is that, what is that word that we use to kind of capture what's going on between the corporate layer and the users, I think there are a couple of things going on. First of all, there's the classic sort of, you know, uh, customer feedback. You know, let's gather all these ideas, filter them, see what makes sense, right, and then incorporate it into our systems. Right? On the other hand, there is this idea of placation. We want to persuade our um, customers or users that, you know, we're all on the same page. This is a win-win situation, you know. Um, there's no us versus them, so that's part of it. And then finally, there's this cultivation, right? They just, they don't just want, it's not actually really about the bottom line. There's more things going on. Saying that is uh, kind of a flattening out of what's going on. They're trying to cultivate a um, uh, engagement that creates a sort of dynamism. They don't want people to just be happy, that's not it. They want people to fight, they want people to, you know, um, to, to, to discuss and even to uh, rebel against the game itself because that discussion, that's energy, right? That creates buzz, okay? So these three things I think are going on and I hope more of it will be going on that I can find out about, you know, throughout the course of my research. 
if you did you want to respond to that? Um, uh, well, I, I guess the question wasn't directly touching on wellness programs, but um, I, I guess I'll speak to wellness programs in, in terms of uh, governance. Um, so I, I guess some of our, our pre preoccupation with wellness programs is the idea of whether they are truly voluntary um, because they are part of the workplace, um, such that you know people are not necessarily voting, right? to say whether the, the workplace can have a wellness program or not, and people are not voting to say what um, shape the uh, wellness program will take. Um, and also, a lot of the wellness program uh, is really about shifting the responsibility, right, for uh, losing weight, for living a healthy lifestyle, lifestyle onto the individual worker. Um, there's not really a real discussion of whether the work infrastructure itself can be shaped to uh, achieve the same thing. So it's basically, the uh, a lot of it we're seeing is really the, uh, the, corporate, uh, the corporation advocating its responsibility. I, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, abdicating, right? Its responsibility for this, um, for a healthier worker and uh, essentially forcing that responsibility onto the individual worker and we're worried about what that means, right? If the individual worker is in a, a, a wellness program, is there then a sense that that worker must become healthy, even given the structural constraints to becoming healthier, um, even with those present and not really um, addressed? And what does that mean for um, workplace discrimination based on data? based on healthism, right? Based on obesity, based on smoking. Um, so in my course of my research, I actually found uh, that in about five states in America, it's perfectly okay for your employer to fire you if you're a smoker outside the workplace. So you're not smoking in the workplace and perhaps it doesn't impact your job, but if they have this data on you, which they can acquire through wellness programs, they can, that is actionable data for them to fire you and you would have no legal redress. So these things are concerning um, and I think it's important that we continue to discuss this because um, you know, they, they ha there perhaps is an issue of coercion uh, attached to wellness programs when you think that uh, a lot of the ways they get people to uh, join are through incentives and the EOC recently passed several rules saying that they can do up to 30% of the premium as an incentive and up to 50% of the premium evidence as an incentive for smoker cessation programs. Um, so obviously this becomes not an, uh, a negligent amount of money if you're thinking uh, you know, $2,000, $3,000. Can I jump the queue? <laughs> Because I had a question that just popped in my head. Um, it seems like in every one of your cases there is um, maybe an implicit appeal that a social need or desire work um, outside of market demands. So each of these corporate settings has a particular vested interest in um, being able to uh, keep players playing a particular way, keep the news feeds uh, functioning as they are. Um, and, and I think for both your cases, for, for Nathan and Ifioma, there, there are these clear cases where market demands say the corporation has a vested interest in doing something different than what the players or the participants might want. Yet there seems to be this sense that, that we would, why is it that we're still seeking um, a certain kind of social um, prioritization or a social good? Uh, from a corporation? What, what, what is it that sends us in the direction of the corporation as kind of hopeful citizens of sorts? So Rebecca, your question is really interesting in that regard. So for, for your different projects, have you gotten a sense of why it is that the participants see um, the CEO or other, you know, the, cor the, the company as the site of recourse for this desire for a social, really extra market need? Yeah, I think that's one of the most interesting things I've seen so far in my very early analysis of the, the comments is 
that there is this inherent expectation by the users that Facebook uh, somehow be truthful or somehow what they're doing isn't um, when they're not showing them all of their friends in their feed. And this, re this has been shown by research that has been done on the news feed by Christian Sandvig and others. Um, all, and it's, we're very early in this work and that's why to Tarleton's question, it's like, we don't know what we have yet. And so um, what we do know is that the work that's been done has shown that users are somewhat confused, some of them feel like they're being lied to when they don't know that not all of their friends are showing up. And um, the title of that paper is great because it's like, I just thought that person didn't like me, um, something to that effect. And um, so this, this shows for me that these users uh, in this study rely on Facebook to maintain personal connections and they have assumptions about what's happening and when they're not meeting those assumptions and they feel you know, a sense of anger um, at what's occurring. Well, in the case of EVE Online, uh, users or players look to the company uh, for a kind of social justice, if you will, because the company thinks that it makes good business sense, right? There's a very fine line between wanting to please your user, wanting to take their votes at face value, and then redesigning the system by, in a way, adapting those, uh, ad adapting mass player will. So on one hand, they have to give them what they want, right? Otherwise, they would rage quit or they would just exit from the system. But on the other hand, they have to sort of, you know, come up with something new. So it's a, it's a fine balance that they have to strike in that, um, uh, in that way. I can go. Uh, so... Um I think maybe the cases of Wikipedia and Reddit are counterexamples to uh, Eve or Facebook in that you know, my impression from what I've read so far is that like in the case of Wikipedia, um, people who are participants and active contributors like do like have this sense that it is a public good, that by donating to it, and by it not being a corporation and having all of these structures of governance like elected Wikipedians on the foundation's board and other things, that it is to some degree accountable to uh, its participants. Where it gets tricky is when people who aren't contributors to Wikipedia find themselves affected by the power of this very unusual thing, uh, which is when they sometimes turn to like who they imagine they might need to turn to, like following classic scripts of holding power accountable. I think in the case of Reddit, there's a lot of tension um, in that, uh, and the tension that's become very visible in the last week uh, when Reddit for the first time started banning particular subreddits for the kinds of conversations and behavior that they saw on the site. Uh, and you know, for a long time, They've seen Reddit as a place that has more or less hands-off policy over what is appearing on Reddit. There are competing business models in the site, one which is advertising-driven, one which is based on uh, users actually paying the company for various perks and to literally, when you pay for Reddit gold, you're, like if you meet the day's challenge, there's a new server added to the farm. So it's very much a kind of membership <coughs> drive style thing and it gives you the ability to exchange gifts with other Redditors. And I think that this debate over the role of moderators and what power they have in contrast with the company is at the heart of this question of what it means for Reddit to be a corporation or whether it's imagined as something else. I'll pass this to Stacey so she can have I wanted to add one other thing. I've been reading some of the comments and the ones I've seen have been all, why are you doing this to me? And I want to point out it's easy to fall in that trap of only looking at the negative. Um, but there are a lot of comments as well where people say, this is great. I have to be friends with this person because of this relationship, but I don't want to see anything that they post. And so these, um, <laughs> these companies are in this you know, unique position of, of how, do, how do we best make our customers happy, give them the information they want. And, and so looking at how they do that is not uh, unique. You know, this is obviously goes in the early days of journalism and throughout that all that history of gatekeeping and so on. Um, 
But what's different about it is we don't know necessarily how they're doing this process. And so um, that's where you get users' confusion and sometimes anger. But oftentimes, you also get users who are very satisfied with the product as well. So in fairness, I wanted to throw that out there. Um, well, to get back to, to your original question about um, how we're essentially um, relinquishing right, the solution for a social good to corporations. Um, I think it's really a classic example of trying to fix a complex problem with a simple solution and um, thinking that simple solution is some sort of panacea, right? Um, and the, the complex problem that we see um, wellness programs att attempting to address really is that as Americans, our lifestyle is unhealthy. We sit a lot, you know, sitting is a new smoking, as they say. We eat a lot <laughs> and not of the right things, right? We don't exercise a lot because we don't have time. We're working eight to 12 hour days. Uh, so this is a complex lifestyle problem. Um, it's a complex infrastructure problem, the way our cities are designed, um, the way our suburbs are designed. Um, so such that we're now trying to fix it with something as simple as a wellness program, um, there's going to be issues, right? Um, it's not necessarily going to have the intended results. Um, and what worries me most, I, I guess, as, as a lawyer, um, is the unintended results, um, which are loss of privacy um, and also the new avenues for discrimination in the workplace. Um, because here's the thing, um, the anti-discrimination laws we currently have, um, they don't really address obesity discrimination. They don't really address smoking discrimination. Um, so if we have wellness programs that are really centering uh, those uh, behaviors as problematic or as pathological, uh, what does that mean for the worker? What does that mean for the rights of the worker? Let me time check. Are we okay on time? Okay. Um, hi, I'm Nick Siever. I'm from UC Irvine. Uh, these are all super interesting projects, so thank you for, for sharing. And one thread that seems to sort of link a lot of them is an interest in uh, what is happening to different sorts of collective kinds. So we have like crowds and publics and councils and workforces and user bases and all of these different kinds of groups. And I'm wondering uh, how much you guys see, and I think this has sort of been latent in some of the questions so far, how much you guys see your, your role as being to uh, identify the particularities of those kinds of things, right? What, what does it mean to be a user base? What does it mean to be a user base now? Uh, what does it mean to be a council? What does it mean to be a council now in EVE? That sort of thing. Because what I've had a problem with in my own work is not doing that and then landing in a place where I'm sort of implicitly endorsing some kind of collective kind that I'm just pretending is the natural way it ought to be as opposed to, you know, uh, some sort of historically particular thing. Right, I've been having that problem as well. This is a question of, you know, is it the same or is it a different, right? And uh, what, is, what, is the, what is the value of comparing it to things that ca have come in the past? Like, for example, you know, especially with reality television, you know, I just thought about this, you know, yesterday. Oh, wow, you know, there's this, there's this phenomenon that's actually so similar in many ways, and yet something feels different. And I think thinking about that feeling of different, at least, you know, at this stage of the research process is really useful because what it gives us a chance to think about is not just, at, in my case at, at least, how is democracy changing or how is society changing, but how are the meanings of consumption changing? And it really is changing. Think about, you know, being a video game consumer 20 years ago and think about being it today in a game like EVE Online, or even in a game like Habbo Hotel. You can do so many more things, you know? You're expected to engage, you're expected to make friends, you're expected to, you know, to, to, you know, build an empire, have a lot of money, you know? Otherwise, what are you gonna do? You're not really playing the game. People are gonna ask you, how long have you been playing? You know, what kind of player are you? All these notions of identity are sort of, you know, um, foisted on us in a way. I'm a researcher, and people ask me, so you play EVE, what do you do in EVE, as if that's my second career? No, it's not, <laughs> I have a career. 
So yeah, I think that's a question that I ask. And from you know, using the methodologies that I have, which are interpretive, that is the best kind of question that I can have, and then build it out to the system level. How does this then, from this perspective, how does this jigsaw piece connect to the rest of it? Um. Well, I, I think the historical context is really important. Um, and for me, I, I think of that in terms of defining what a worker is today, right? Um, and you know, that's also defining the group I'm looking at. Um, and I think what is a defining thing uh, for the group that we're looking at is the technology available. So workplace surveillance is not new, right? Um, from when there was division of labor, there also arose the need to surveil the workers to make sure that they're doing what you want them to do and in a timely manner, just, you know, they're not malingering. Um, but what is new is the advances in technology, right, that have now enabled us to survey and track the worker in ways that were previously unimaginable and that is uh, collapsing or keeps collapsing the line between work and non-work. So recently there was a case where a woman uh, was fired from her job and she sued because she was fired for her job, from her job for deleting an app on her phone that was tracking her. And when she signed up for the job, she was told about this app. So here's the thing, it's supposedly transparent. What she was not told was that the app could never be turned off such that even when she had finished work and turned off the app, it was still on. And her boss could track her every movement. Not only could he track her every movement, he felt it was a power play to tell her uh, exactly how much of her movements she, he was tracking, including how fast she was driving, where she went over the weekend, et cetera. So obviously this is a huge intrusion on privacy. Um, and I know, and a, a, a previously really uh, un, unforeseen one, you know, be, before we had such technologies. Um, so now, really, we have to redefine what it means to be a worker in our society, given all the technological advancements. So, so your question about, you know. What is it when we talk about like crowds or groups? I think is one that really plagues the kind of research that I'm doing. Uh, Kevin Driscoll and I, who share an office, um, have been having this debate around BBSs. Like we tend to talk about um, technologies and the users of a particular technology as if they are some kind of like. Uh, group that we can identify with common interests and goals. And people you know, talk about Twitter in that way. People talk about Wikipedia in that way. They talk about Reddit in that way, for sure. Um, and you know, within those uh, you know, platforms and in the conversations that people and relationships people have outside of them, like their identities and communities are constituted in a huge variety of ways. I think what brings them together uh, at the point of moderation is that there are some of these common expectations that uh, the moderators are having to negotiate. There are common uh, tools that they're using um, and they're having to figure out how to um, like work at that intersection between what uh, you know, a company with less than 100 employees is defining as the space of their, their work um, and the vast multiplicity of communities that relating to. And you know, I think we have yet to find uh, the language to like, talk about those things really clearly. Uh, and I'm very, very open to like, hearing people's suggestions. I think there's also an aspect of work in this project as well. Like, uh, in, uh, Postigo's research on AOL community leaders in the 90s found that the more AOL did to kind of control and track and uh, standardized how its community volunteers did their moderation, the more those people thought of themselves as a like collective 
the more they felt like they were workers that were uncompensated. Mm -hmm. So there's a sense in which these volunteers like are able to do this volunteer work or like feel perhaps feel motivated to do this, this volunteer work precisely because they don't think of themselves as like Reddit employees. And those are questions that I'll be untangling as I look at their onboarding process, their gripes, the challenges that they face in this moderation work. Um, for me, a really influential work was Marvin's When Old Technologies Were New. And um, it's an amazing look at technologies through history and how people reacted to them. And so for me, um, that's what I'm interested in. I feel like we're in this lucky time where, as you mentioned, nothing is new. Like the more you do research, the more you learn. Nothing is new. This is just a new iteration of something. Um, and I feel it's, it's a fortunate time to be alive and a researcher and looking at how people are starting to make sense of these things that are mediating so many of their communications. My larger dissertation work uh, moves beyond Facebook and looks at algorithms in a bigger picture. So whenever you're getting information presented to you, Twitter, Google, Facebook, and so on, um, how do we make sense of these? And so for me, the user base um, question, so far I haven't necessarily answered, but I'm more interested in society and, and looking at it from a different, you know, broader picture, I suppose, as to a specific user base, but more or less this technology and this mechanism, um, this mediation that's happening, how do we understand it? Okay. Perfect. We're good on time. So with that, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.